This is episode 10 of Amos chapter 8. And here's Amos up here, contemporary of Jonah and Hosea. So Amos was active circa 760 to 753 BC, just seven years in total. He preached during the rules of King Hosea of Judah, is over here, who reigned for 52 years, and Jeroboam II of Israel, who reigned for 41 years. And the reigns of the two kings overlapped about 15 years. The north and the south were at the zenith of their power. They both experienced national stability, prosperity, and the expansion of their kingdoms. So chapter 1, I had to break up into chapter 1a and chapter 1b, and if you need a recap, you can pause and read it over here. So chapter 2, the judgment on Judah and Israel, chapter 3, a prophet's authority to preach to Israel, and chapter 4, Israel, prepare to meet your God. You can pause and read this if you want to. Chapter 5, Amos laments Israel. Chapter 6, woe to the complacent, because why? Because God is now their enemy. And you can pause and read this if you want to. 1, 2, and 3 of the locusts and the fire and the plumb line. This was a symbolic vision. And you can pause and read this. This is the previous version, chapter 7. We're now on chapter 8. So the layout of Amos illustrates his key idea, judgment comes, we've done chapters 1 to 7, we're now on chapter 8, the vision of the basket of fruit, summer fruit. So we had the locust, the fire, the plumb line, and now we're on the summer fruit, and then we're on chapter 9 as the final one here. So let's dive into chapter 8, vision of the summer fruit basket. So the fourth vision is symbolic. Verse 1. Thus the Lord God showed me, Behold, a basket of summer fruit. Verse 2, And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them any more. A basket of summer fruit. The vision is of end of the year summer fruit. That is the overripe to almost rotting fruit, like the northern kingdom is rotting and must be plucked. The Jews have a double year, and their dates are aligned with the seasons. They have a religious year and a civil year. And the religious year starts in Nisan around March, April, here in our spring. And on the Gregorian calendar, it's March, April, and it goes all the way around until Adar. God took the Israelites out of Egypt, and all the firstborn died, but the angel of death passed over the Hebrews, and so they celebrate that here in Nisan. Exodus 12 This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So the second year is their civil year. That starts in Tishri, which is October, uh, September, October, which is basically our harvest month. And it starts in Tishri and ends in Elul. And these are the harvest months. Tishri is the head of the year, and Nisan is the head of months. If you're a Gentile like me, you may be confused like me. So let me explain it the way I understand it. Imagine a year is two full circles running concurrently next to each other like an engagement ring and a wedding ring on the bride's fingers. Imagine the engagement ring has a mark for spring and the wedding ring has a mark for harvest. And so when spring comes around each year, the religious year starts. And when harvest comes around, the civil year starts. So on any given day during the year cycle, you are in both years. That's why I understand it. If it didn't help, I'm sorry. (laughs) So this vision of summer fruit is about a play on words. The fruit basket was chosen for how it sounds when spoken in the north. It doesn't sound the same in the south, but in the north, kayet sounds just like the word for the final hour. So for in English, we would have like week and week or sun and sun. They sound the same, but they're totally different. So Amos is using clever word play to get his message across. Israel has reached their hour of doom. The Creator has had enough of them. Verse 3. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. Songs of the temple shall be wailing. When God gets angry, all he has to do is stand back. 
Suddenly the blessings disappear and God no longer shields us from evil. Can you imagine the terror should God abandon us and we are left to our own devices? God said to Hosea for 10 chapters, I will abandon Israel. They are spiritual whores and will be wiped out. Hosea 4, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Shall be wailing in the day. So the people are greedy, corrupt and dishonest. The rich live luxury lifestyle while trampling the poor. A biblical principle is you reap what you sow. In a practical sense, this means you sow wheat, you reap wheat. In a religious sense, you sow paganism, you reap a hurricane of disasters. Hosea 8, they sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. Ephraim will be destroyed, never to rise again. Bodies everywhere. This will be a genocide of the northern kingdom, widespread slaughter of every level of society. Israel had become a two-class society, the rich and the poor, the haves and have-nots. This oppression of the poor was directly against God's moral code, as laid out by Moses in the law. Exodus 23, you shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. And Deuteronomy 15, for the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother. Be generous to your poor and your needy in your land. Here's the poor needy. Matthew 26, Jesus said, For you have the poor with you always. In that day, the greedy rich won't be able to buy or bribe themselves out of the coming bloodbath. Wailing and silence. There will be no thanksgiving songs for this harvest of woes. Only the silence of despair. Now, verses 4 to 6 are the indictment of their rotten society, of their greed, selfishness, and oppression. Verse 4, hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail. Make the poor of the land fail. The disparity between the uber-rich and downtrodden poor is enormous. God has always had a special place in his heart for the widows and orphans and the poor and needy. Once Jesus happened to be passing a funeral procession, of a dead man being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. This meant the woman was now destitute with no way to fend for herself. So Jesus, in his compassion, stopped and raised the young man from the dead. He just happened to be passing such compassion. Verse 5. When will the new moon be passed, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, that we may trade wheat, making the ephah, small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit. So the new moon passed and the Sabbath. The wealthy and the merchants didn't want to observe official religious or holy days because it meant they lost money when they couldn't trade. They can't wait to get back to business. It's always about the money. Today as Christians, we happily celebrate the pagan Easter and Christmas and worse, we declare them holy days. Only God decides what's holy and pagan festivals Definitely are not. So here's a little bunny for Easter. In fact, it's Passover that we should be celebrating. But the pagan people that do our, our schedules today, do our calendars today, they make sure that Easter never falls on Passover. So as Christians, we're celebrating the little bunnies, whereas we should be celebrating God's releasing the, the Israelites from Egypt. And here's Christmas. This was a ba pagan holiday where they murdered little children. They burned them alive on fires. That was the pagan holiday, and we celebrated as Christmas. All Saints Day, or All Hallows Eve, was a day of prayer and remembering the dead. It has been perverted into the occult Halloween, when even Christian kids dress up as witches and wizards. Thank goodness my son doesn't let that happen. When Christians accept what seems to be just a small change, a little tweak to God's moral and community laws. It becomes a slippery slope as Satan quickly perverts it to his demonic ways. Making the ephah small and a shekel large. The ephah was a basket for dry measurement that's supposed to legally hold a bushel, but it is intentionally made smaller so that it cannot hold a full bush bushel. You think you're buying a full bushel, but the basket is a little bit smaller or a little bit shorter than it should be. So you're getting less in the bushel. When they 
measure out your bushel, you're not getting a bushel. And the shekel was not the coinage like today. It was the unit of measure, like an ounce or a pound, and was supposed to legally represent an ephah, but was slightly heavier than an ephah. So by design, they measured a little short when it came to giving you your grain and then overcharged on the silver that you had to pay. Their greediness extended to every unethical business practice. So let's say this was the shekel and it was uh, it weighed an ounce or whatever. And so you had to pay for your bushel of corn. They'd, they'd measure it out, give it to you, and then they would put this on the scale and say, okay, put your silver in here to equal the weight. But now the, this was heavier than it should have been. So instead of paying, say, a dollar in silver for your ephah, you had to pay a dollar ten to get the scales to weigh out. So they gave you a little less there, and then they forced you to pay more. So they were double charging you. Their greediness extended to every unethical business practice in order to increase their profits, falsifying the scales by de deceit. Their weights were deliberately inaccurate. So they double cheated the poor, who were already struggling. And the merchants knew it and did it anyway. And today, 3,000 years later, nothing's changed. You, get, you buy a packet of chips, it's a nice big bag, it's all full of air because when you open it, there's just a little pile of chips at the bottom, but it's in a big bag full of air, a little pile of chips. Leviticus 19, nothing's changed, 3,000 years, nothing's changed. Leviticus 19, you shall do no injustice in judgment, in measurement of length, weight, or volume. You shall have honest scales, honest weights, an honest ephah, and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Nothing's changed. Verse 6, That we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. They're so proud of that. Even sell the bad wheat. Buy the poor for silver. In Amos chapter 2, the practice of selling a slave into bondage was condemned. They had perverted their justice system because judges could be bribed with silver to find in favor of the wealthy and force the poor to work off some alleged paltry debt, essentially granting the man free labor. Here Amos decries the buying of people. We can buy the poor for silver. Plain and simple, this is human trafficking. Slavery was not allowed according to the law of Moses. Well, it was allowed, but there was a lot of laws protecting the slaves. But Ephraim had adopted the practice of their pagan neighbors of literally buying and selling human beings. So the law of Moses allowed you to have slaves, but the practice was well controlled. Israel's national experience had been one of slavery. So Solomon had a treaty of brotherhood with his pagan neighbors that they would not buy or sell Hebrews. But by Amos' time, Israel ignored this pesky rule. They were enslaving their own people. They buy the poor for silver. Amos 1, Amos is decrying Israel's enemies for slavery. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, that's the Philistine land where the giants were, or for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. So the giants would take, uh, overrun a community and take the entire community, the whole captivity, men, women, and children, and sell them to the Edomites. And so Amos in chapter 1 already, we're in chapter 8, is already talking about this human trafficking is not good. The needy for a pair of sandals. And to add insult to injury, the rich man held the poor man's shoes in custody as collateral while he worked off the paltry debt. The mark of a slave was he went barefoot whereas a citizen wore shoes. Even sell the bad wheat. Not content with all their other thievery, the merchants even sold rotting wheat, their garbage as though it was good wheat. If this substandard wheat was found in their own storehouses, they would throw it away, but instead they sell it to the poor. Or they mix some chaff in with the wheat to bolster the quantity and sell this to the poor. They were corrupt at every level. Micah 3, her heads, leaders, judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Verse 7, the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Jacob, 
Amos personalizes the north, calls the land Jacob. Remember Jacob? He wrestled with an angel all night, then God changed his name to Israel. So Jacob is Israel is the northern kingdom, the pride of Jacob. This is the only place in the Bible that we find this expression. The arrogance and haughtiness of the northern kingdom thinks they can do anything and get away with it because regardless of their disgusting sins and outright paganism, they still arrogantly consider themselves to be God's chosen. Their pride blinds them to the reality that God is watching. Micah 3, yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. Surely I will never forget any of their works. God is so affronted by their evil, he declares he will never forget their deeds. In Revelation 7, Jesus says in his seven letters to the churches, I know your deeds. God is watching. Today when Jesus looks down on us at our child sex trafficking, child adrenochrome harvesting, hundreds of millions of abortions, even after the baby is born alive, child and baby organ harvesting, that's why they want the baby born alive, so they can harvest its organs. And we transgender children by removing a little boy's penis and a little girl's breast. Luke 17, Jesus said, It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. And look at all what we're doing today. We're way past the swamp. Verse 8, shall the land not tremble for this and everyone mourn who dwells in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. Shall the land not tremble? Natural disasters will befall Israel like shattering earthquakes. Quakes are God's most common instrument of his wrath. I went through the 6.7 quake in California in 1994, whose epicenter in Northridge was the site of the biggest porn studios in the world. Quakes are God's most common instrument of his wrath. The quake tossed me right out of bed. And the aftershocks caused the land to tremble for weeks. Isaiah speaks of the earth staggering to and fro like a drunk, the land swaying back and forth. Swell, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. Amos likens the earthquakes to the rise and fall of the Nile River. The Nile is the longest river in Africa. It's four. 1,130 miles long and flows through 11 countries on its way to the Mediterranean. In ancient times, there was quite a large variation in the natural flow of the Nile, depending on the season and the weather upstream. It's the lifeline of Egypt and played a crucial role in the development of the Egyptian civilization. Every year, the river rose 21 to 25 feet and overflowed its banks and deposited new layers of rich silt making the surrounding land very fertile. Amos compares the annual heaving and subsiding of the Nile to the vast Assyrian army that would heave up and flood over their evil land. The land will tremble. Heave and subside. Even though the nation has risen, heaved to greatness, God will make the nation fall or subside into the hands of their greatest enemy, and they will be no more. There's quite a few interpretations of this heave and subside. So here's the Nile, 4,000 miles long start in Lake Victoria. It's always been accepted that it starts there, except Rwanda dug out this little tributary and said, now they want to claim it. As the head of the Nile, it's the White Nile travels through all these African countries. At Khartoum, it joins up with the Blue Nile that's coming from Lake Tana in Ethiopia, and then the Nile continues on its way through Egypt and empties into the Mediterranean. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. Israel typically looked forward to that day, Judgment Day, when they thought that God would wipe out their enemies and exalt his chosen, them. Amos warned that that day would come, but not as Israel expected. They would be the target of God's wrath. Chapter 5 of Amos, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, for what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. I will make the sun go down at noon. This is an allusion to the north that has reached the zenith of its power, as the sun reaches its zenith at noon. 
After that, it's downhill. Perhaps Amos is also trying to remind Israel that God brought darkness upon Egypt as the ninth plague. God did it before, and he'll do it again. But this time, it would be the north who would stumble around and bump into things in the dark. But on Judgment Day, that day of the Great Tribulation, the darkness of the sun will be total. Revelation says this will not be a simple eclipse. Jewish scholars believe it will be the deep darkness of a destroyed sun. Can you imagine never having daylight, only ever nighttime? Revelation 6. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Moses tells us of the curses of God if the people fail to adhere to their Mosaic covenant that they swore to uphold at Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy 28, the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart, and you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and plundered continually, and no one shall save you. I will darken the earth in broad daylight. Why would an eclipse freak everybody out? Because it's only temporary and doesn't cause any actual harm. So why? Because darkness is often used to illustrate God's displeasure and both the quakes and the eclipse signify the start of the unleashing of God's wrath. Their judgment time has come. In verse 1, God says, I will not pass by them anymore. And in broad daylight, the Assyrians attacked and overran Israel and the earth was darkened with the spilled blood of the people. Verse 10, I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son and its end like a bitter day. I will turn your feasts into mourning. The north loved their pagan feasts and festivals, bowing and scraping to their little gods. It's a time of joy and celebration. But in the aftermath of the devastating earthquakes, God will turn their festivities into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. To me, the saddest scripture of lamentation is when Absalom, the son of King David, tried to take his father's throne and was killed in the process. And even though his son had been treasonous, David wept for him, a deep song of mourning, of lamentation. 2 Samuel 18 Then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said thus, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. God says he will turn all Israel's songs into lamentation. Sackcloth and baldness. These are outward signs of despair and mourning. Genesis 37, Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. Ancient Israelites didn't cut off their hair or their beards, and Nazarites like Samson never cut their hair at all. But now they will as a sign of deep grief. Isaiah 22, And in that day, the Lord God of hosts called for weeping and for mourning, for boldness and for girding with sackcloth. I will make it like mourning for an only son. David had many sons. Still he sobbed over the death of Absalom, one of his favorites. The son is the heir, and the future of the family depends on him. The loss of an only son meant the end of a bloodline, a catastrophic event. When God took the firstborn of every Egyptian, including the Pharaoh's son, he was so devastated that he kicked out the Israelites who had been his slaves for 400 years. Of course, Pharaoh rapidly regretted this action when he realized the impact on his economy, but it was too late. The Jews had, had gone. Verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The days are coming. In times of great distress, people turn to the Lord for comfort. But in Israel's coming judgment, all their appeals will be ignored and the Lord will remain silent. 
Micah 3. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. After the New York City Twin Towers fell, the church was filled to capacity. But once the danger seemed past, they all drifted away again, and the church was emptied. Let's hope that as our nation today calls out to the Lord for mercy, that our prayers are not met with the awful silence of God because of our dreadful sins. Micah 3, then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds and we have been evil. A famine of hearing the words with an S, of hearing the words of the Lord. So the Jews accepted that God dwelt in heaven, but his presence also filled the temple in Jerusalem, but not the north sacrilegious temple. God would remove his presence from their land entirely. He would become inaccessible and unavailable. They still had access to the Torah, to his word, but they did not have access to his presence, his words. In ancient times, if a king wanted to go to war, for example, the king would ask the prophets or priests for God's guidance, for the words of the Lord, for the words of the Lord. The priests and prophets, they were the intercessors between the king and the people and God. The high priest would put his hand in his ephod to reach the Urim and Thummim kept there. So this is his ephod, this is his undergarment and his tunic, and this colorful thing is the ephod, and this breastplate has got the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. So the high priest would put his hand in his ephod to reach the Urim and Thummim kept there. If he withdrew a white stone, the priest advocated war because God was with him and would bless him. If it was a black stone, they recommended staying home. Getting a black-white stone was never considered random, but was always considered the verdict of God. But Israel's priests and prophets were fake. They were selected by the king, not ordained by God. They disliked the inconvenient, godly truth and instead preached reassuring lies. Therefore, they had no access to the one true God, to hearing his words, and thus no way to make God-ordained decisions. The priests didn't want to hear God's words when he warned them of their sins. Now they won't hear his words when they desperately need to. Today, we don't hear the words of the Lord in churches either. We hear feel-good stuff, how to heal our relationships and get along with neighbors, etc. Today, preachers wave the Bible and thump it, give a short motivational speech, but seldom preach from it. The Bible is even banned in schools. Look how that has worked out for us. Today we have very few true prophets. We have a famine of the words of God. Paul sums up the gospel that we are not hearing today in three succinct phrases. 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. There is no other. We are saved by the blood of Jesus, the Son of the living God. Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. Matthew 5, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 12, They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord but shall not find it, from sea to sea, north to east. So this covers the entire land of Israel, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Dead Sea. So it's east to west. And also across the Jordan, Transjordan, this area was also part of the kingdom of Israel. So you had side to side and top to bottom. North to east was considered top to bottom. And if you really went all the way down, you would get to the kingdom of Judah, which was on their southern border. And God had not yet removed himself from Judah, nor his blessings, and so they were still a separate kingdom. With these specific instructions of north to east and sea to sea, Amos clarifies he's only talking to the kingdom of Israel, where the people shall wander around all over their kingdom and look, but not find. Run to and fro, seeking, but shall not find it. In verse 11, the words of God meant God communicating with his people, speaking and guiding them. But now it's the Torah, the word of God, that they seek. 
They'll run around the entire land, but they had rejected the word of the Lord and selected fake priests that don't know the word and false prophets that know even less. So they can seek, but they won't find because there's no one in Israel that can hear or teach God's true word. Verse 13. In that day, the fair virgins and strong young men shall faint from thirst. In that day. This was a common prophetic word formula to indicate the start of a new thought or a new oracle. In that day is when the many predicted judgments will finally happen. But it offers no hint if God's judgment is imminent or far off. The fair virgins and strong young men. This is the pride of a nation, their youngsters, their bloodline, their country's future with their entire lives ahead of them. But they will be thrust into survival mode so early in their young lives shall faint from thirst. This is a physical and a spiritual thirst. It's a physical lack of available water, so bad that even their resilient young men and women will faint from thirst. It's also a spiritual thirst because the nation will wander around searching for the presence of God. This dual thirst is perfectly explained in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 2, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. This is a cistern found under a playground in Jerusalem in 2005. And I always thought of a cistern as really being like a big clay pot about the size of a Volkswagen that they filled with water. But this is an underground. Look at the size of this thing. And here's a snorkeler just so you can get perspective of the size of this thing. And imagine when it's filled with water. I mean... Millions and millions of gallons of water would be down there. It's amazing. This is a cistern. They've forsaken me for a fountain of living waters. Verse 14. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Bathsheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Those who swear. Since Israel bowed to many gods and goddesses, it was important to know which little god you were addressing or bowing to, since each little god was identified with a specific blessing or curse. And these little statuettes were territorial. Pagans believed this god worked here, but for the same blessing in a different location, you had to approach another god. <laughs> Must have been confusing. The sin of Samaria. Bethel was part of the administrative region of Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. The first golden calf was built and erected in Bethel and became the sanctuary of the king, the pagan temple where he worshipped, the way of Bathsheba. Bathsheba was in Judah in the south, but it seems from the book of Amos that they too had some sort of idol. In ancient times, pilgrimages to the cities of Abraham and Isaac were still common. But now Amos calls out Bethel, Bathsheba and Dan, where pilgrimages were undertaken, but to worship false gods. As your God lives, O Dan. This is an oath formula. The second golden calf was erected in Dan. In fact, both golden calves were fashioned by the tribe of Dan, to whom God had granted all the skills they needed to help Moses build the tabernacle. The people trusted in false gods, but they called them the God of Israel and swore allegiance to them. Since the north and south split 200 years previously, the Israelites had been taught idolatry and worshipped what they thought of as the God of Israel. The nation was sincere in their worship, but they were sincerely wrong. They shall fall and never rise again. In 763 BC, just two years after Amos spoke this word, there was a massive earthquake, and the land heaved and fell like the Nile. This coincided with an eclipse at noon, and a deep darkness covered the trembling land. You cannot defy God and think you will get away with it. Let's remember from chapter 5, from God's point of view, Israel were dissolute pagans with no redeeming qualities. God's appeal in chapter 5 verse 4 was, Seek me and live. Verse 6, Seek the Lord and live. Verse 14, Seek good, not evil, and that you may live. But they didn't, and they died. So this is the end of chapter 8, the symbolic vision of the sum of the fruits of basket. The legitimate religion was in the temple at Jerusalem. The illegitimate one were the golden calves in the north. 
and God equates them to just a basket of rotting fruit. Let me pray of you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you for sitting through eight chapters with me. We've got just one cha- one chapter left, chapter nine. And so I'll see you there. God bless you, God bless you, and shalom.